Welcome to the Africa in Harlem video podcast live from the village of Harlem. I'm Issa. If you watch the news, you probably saw the story of Dijeni Jarrell, the 24-year-old mother who threw her two children out of the window of her second floor apartment before jumping herself. This happened Saturday morning. Gerald is the mother of a month-old baby girl and a two-year-old boy. Witnesses said she looked distraught and the mother herself told one of her neighbors who came to the rescue that she was tired of being alone and not getting enough sleep. Today's guest is parent advocate Joyce Macmillan, who is the founder of JMAC for Families, a Harlem-based nonprofit organization trying to redefine child welfare. Thank you, Joyce, for joining us. What was your reaction when you heard the story, and what do you think led to the tragedy? The reaction when I heard the story was my heart went out to mom and her children. Mm -hmm. I thought what type of pain she must have been in um, to do such a thing. I thought about lack of resources. I thought about how much she actually loved her children and how in that moment her action did not express that. I felt very sorry for her. I had a lot of empathy and sympathy as the world around us who listened to the story be told on the news criminalized and demonized her without knowing her life experiences and knowing um, where she may have been in that moment mentally. And without taking responsibility, because that could have been one of our neighbors and understanding who our neighbors are, what type of support they need and being willing to provide that. Um, we're always um, so quick to criticize and judge instead of being up and being the change that we want to see. It's easy to talk, but what are you doing? That's how I felt in that moment. What do you think led to, to that? And not knowing mom, but just assessing from the things that I've heard from eyewitnesses, like the young man who said on the news that her eyes were glazed over. I felt that um, possibly she was struggling with a mental health condition um, that may have been untreated, maybe some postpartum stuff related. Um, that's what I've and he also said that um, Dejeuner herself told him that she was tired of being alone and not getting enough sleep. We don't know. Her baby could have been colicky. Could have been some other things going on with the baby, possibly, where the baby didn't sleep well at night. Some babies, it take a really long time for them to adjust between day and night. So you'll have some babies who, for an extreme amount of time will sleep in a day and want to be up at night. And so, I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, sleep deprivation is a real thing and it definitely impacts our mental health. Why do you think she did not ask for help? Because from what uh, the neighbors said, it seems that she was living alone with her two children. Why do you think she didn't ask for help? Many parents have told me they didn't ask for help because um, help is an illusion to them. Um, they say oftentimes the system provides surveillance and they refer to it as support, but there's nothing tangible provided to them. Um, it feels like more stress as they ask them a lot of questions, um, verify information like their word can't be taken, um, all without helping to rectify whatever the need was that brought them to the attention of that person and or agency in the first place. So they have, they have their own agenda of data collecting, basically, and they call that support. Yes, um, some women have, have had that experience. And, you know, we, we, we speak about the number of black women who are dying every year while giving birth in this country. 
Yes. And women, black women often say that their pain is unheard. Do you think that it's the same thing that is happening when sometimes black women are reaching out for help and their pain is unheard? And as you said, um, there is another Absolutely. Agenda. First of all, I don't believe that white America believe that black people are human. I don't believe somewhere in their head that they believe that black people can feel pain. That's physical pain, emotional pain, or anything related to feelings. They don't believe that we have them. Um, it's really unfortunate. Um, it really shows their lack of understanding and or their ignorance. We are people. They try not to treat us as people. I can point to many videos that have gone viral. One of the ones that was most entertaining, but not entertaining in a way, haha, but entertaining in a way like this is really sad. Um, it was a young girl who police were arresting in, um, dang, I can't think of where it was, but she was nine years old. Yonkers, I think it was. And they were arresting her and they were telling her, stop acting like a child. And she's like, I am a child, I'm nine, you know? And they were roughhousing her like you see them do some of the men on the videos. Grabbing her, pulling her, pushing her, um, putting handcuffs on her. And ultimately, when she didn't cooperate because she was screaming and crying for her daddy, saying, call my daddy, call my daddy. Ultimately, they maced her. And what, and you can Google this video. And what's most sad about seeing this happen, like I've watched it over and over, um, what's most sad is one, she's nine years old. But bigger than that, this was a collective of white people. There were at least six or seven officers there, some male and some female. Mothers and fathers, I'm sure but they did not see this nine-year-old as a child. So if you don't see a nine-year-old child as a child, then you don't see us as human. And this has played out in the media many times, mm -hmm. a very long time. Mm -hmm. so, so that's their own sickness. So then don't you think that it's our responsibility in the black community to create that safe space? I think it would be great to create a safe space. Um, I think it's easier said than done because one of the things that black people have already always been blocked from and continues to be blocked from is receiving funding to do things to better themselves and or their community. And so it's not that we don't have the ideas and or the ability is that we don't have the funding. What advice then would you give to young women and young mothers? Because some people would say, well, why, why do you have children that young? Why do you have so many children? Why, 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 why? Before we move to that, I want to move back to the money thing. Um, some people may like this and some people may not, but I, I feel like I have to say it. Um, we could probably maybe do a little more to support ourselves if maybe we didn't buy certain items, stop investing in companies that don't invest in us. Our money is our power, right? And so we have to learn to utilize it in a way where we build wealth, not build the wealth of someone else. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to call anyone out for the things that I think that they could do different. But if each of us think about that and do something just a little different, and find a trusted organization to invest in within the community, you may find that you're strengthening your community and building a better place for your children to grow up. So don't you think that it's part of the trauma also to try to um, look a certain way, to think that doing that will help you get accepted by white America? I think it's more about being accepted by each other within our own community. I don't really think it's about being accepted by um, the white community when we buy certain things, other than um, it's proof that we have money because these items are expensive. And this is not proof that you have money. This is proof that you had money, 
right? Because now you spent it because look what you have, right? Mm -hmm. And I learned very early in life to invest in things that will grow my investment, not to invest in things that deplete my investments, mm -hmm. right? It has to be an asset. So then it's the financial literacy. It is. It absolutely is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely is. I understand that there's items we like, and I understand we feel like we deserve certain things, but the things we deserve are the things that we have not yet seen or touched. And we can't get to those things until we understand and prioritize the things we are invested in. Mm -hmm. So don't you think also that maybe the younger generation doesn't always understand the price that the people that came before paid for them to enjoy certain benefit and understand that they also have a, a responsibility and they need to do something for the community? Unfortunately, I don't think it stops or is limited to the younger generation. I think there's many people our age and older than us who also do not understand the responsibility and that's why that information has not been passed on to the younger generation. Mm -hmm. You can't pass on something you don't know. Mm -hmm. In in my language, they say you cannot recite a lesson you haven't learned, right? Absolutely. So now, what what is what can we do to make things better? You spoke about investing in ourselves, but what else do you think? You, I, I believe you also spoke about receiving the funding needed because you said that you know. People in the community have good ideas. They know how to create the change, but sometimes the resources are not there. Yeah, well, for me, I run an organization. Um, I receive some funding from foundations. I receive some individual funding. Um, but the work that I do with that money is a couple of weeks back, I partnered with a church in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And it was a church in Brooklyn because that's who was willing to partner with me. I reached out to many churches in Harlem and in other areas also, but this particular church thought what I was proposing was interesting and partnered with me. And we gave out 16,000 pampers. Mm -hmm. um, wow. No questions asked. They didn't need to give an email or a phone number. They didn't need to give a home address. They didn't need to give anything. They just needed to say that they were in need and tell us the size of the pamphlet they wanted. And we gave them a box. And it was amazing. Um, as people walked up saying, these pampers are free. Oh my gosh, I don't have a child. Can I please call my niece? Can I call my granddaughter? Can I call my cousin? They have a baby. I know that they need, I just need to ask them the size of the pamper. And so you just really saw the honesty, the trustworthiness. You saw people in need, you saw, people being happy, feeling relieved, and receiving these items. But not only did we give out the pampers that day, we gave out wipes. We didn't give out a pack of wipes. We gave a box of wipes to each person. 800 wipes is in a, in a box, you know, because it's like six or eight packs or something. And we gave out pacifiers and bibs and onesies and other items that um, babies need to be healthy and happy. And by providing these items, we reduce stress in the home. And reducing stress in the home means the children are at less of a risk because stress can create mental health issues, right? And sometimes we try to hold on because we don't trust the people who they put before us to speak to, which are those people that we refer to as mandated reporters, instead of helping me with something I come to them to speak about, they're main, mandated by the state to report me to child services and risk having my family torn apart. So I'm pushing legislation. I know I'm kind of jumping around, but I'm pushing legislation to um, change from being mandated reporters to being mandated supporters. What is the point of reporting someone? Like, what are we doing here? If we know someone has a need, let's refer them, let's help them, let's support them, not report them. It just doesn't make sense. The system is designed to create frustration. Hi, baby boy. An illusion of help and or support. 
none of which is true. And so I just want us to move from that and begin to think about mutual aid, what the things are we need in our community and how can we come together to provide it. There was a question that I asked earlier about some people saying, why these young women are having children? Why are they having so many children sometimes? Why and why? Because if we understand how the system is working, that we understand that as Black women, we will not receive the support that we need. Why do we put sometimes ourselves in, in situations that can lead to that can lead to, to tragedy or unfortunately people learn in hindsight so I don't think people go into situations knowing that they're not going to get the support they need I think that's something they discover after being um, fully engulfed in the situation but secondly my question is why can't they get the help they need it makes no sense that we would take a child out of a family's home because they're lacking something and then take hundreds of dollars a month and give it to a foster parent when we could have gave it to that family and kept that child at home. So it's not that we don't have the money, it's how we choose to spend the money. And that's what it is for me. If you can spend money on a foster parent, you can spend money on a parent. When we think also about the history of the Black family and social services here in this country also, what do you think was um, part of the impact some of the policies have had on black families now is it part of the problem absolutely first of all we have to understand why laws are in place laws are in place to protect them being white folk and to demonize us black folk that's what laws are for um if we look at slavery and what that did to the black community, and then we move forward and they say, okay, slavery has been abolished. And then they say, oh, unless you commit a crime. And then suddenly black men are being arrested for looking at a white woman, for talking to a white woman, for passing a white woman, for anything, you know, like just this frivolous stuff that's, it's not a crime, you know? But now we have slaves because the only way to have slaves in the country is through the 13th Amendment. And so then um, incarceration becomes mass incarceration because we want a mass amount of slaves. And for those who don't believe being incarcerated is slavery, don't just look at the 13th Amendment, look at how slave labor is used even currently today. Um, many of the clothing you buy, the designers are partnered with the prison and industrial complex. License plates, um, many, many things. They're even farming fish in prisons now. So when you see that your fish you're buying is not fresh water, and it says farm raised, many of those farm raised fish came from a prison where people are not being paid for their labor. Um, we went from that so we went from incarceration to mass incarceration because the idea was for America to always keep a mass amount of slaves. And so they used this backdoor mechanism to um, complete their goal, right? To achieve their goal. With that being said, years later, they created this thing called the foster care system. And that system is the prerequisite to incarceration because most children who have spent time in foster care end up incarcerated. The vast majority of children who have been um, in foster care end up incarcerated for five or more years in their lifetime. And so when we look at those statistics and the outcomes for children that they claim to protect, because they call themselves child protection services, then we know what they are saying is not true. The only thing they're protecting these children from is success and what they're actually doing is making foster care be the prerequisite to condition a person to understand this is how black bodies deserve to be treated and to pipeline them into the next system where they will be an official slave. You know, because African Americans here have lost a lot, lot because of the kidnapping and slavery and all the traditions and the training that was done from 
one generation to another, teaching, you know, young women uh, what to do, how to do it, et cetera. We, we, we've lost part of it. And I think that it would have been helpful for young black women, or you were saying earlier that it's not only young, young people, the older also, understand this past history and the business model that this country is, is using to, to be able to exist and thrive. They're always going to push us out of school. School, I think, is a way to divide and conquer. And I'll give you an example. I was lecturing at a college last year, and it was a white school. And I had been invited to this Ivy League school several times, many times I had spoken there. And I spoke there on this particular day, and I shared much of what I share about what systemic racism is, how it shows up, how it stays under the radar, so it's not really seen or acknowledged, and we're able to create narratives around it to make it be the community's responsibility instead of the government's responsibility for setting people up for failure. And a young white man said to me at the end of my lecture, Miss McMillan, um, I'm really tired of white people being blamed for what our ancestors did. I'm really tired of black women having a bunch of babies with a bunch of different baby daddies and blaming us because we don't want to take care of them. I'm really tired that black people don't want to read books and refuse to educate themselves and drop out of school. And, you know, he said a few more things than that. And I was just like, wow. And the class was like, whoa, you know, and they're wondering, how am I going to respond to that? Mm -hmm. And so I stood there for a second and I just really took it in. And some people say my response was clever, but I don't think my response was clever. I think I took a moment to take it in just so I can respond with truth. Because when you respond with truth, you don't need to be clever or savvy or quick on your feet or any of those things. The answer was right there in the room and it was part of the things that I had spoken about. I asked the class, do you know what a landmark is? And everyone looked at me like, oh my God, he really knocked her off her game. Why is she talking about a landmark after all of the things we were speaking about and after his statement? And I said, bear with me. I picked on someone and they told me what a landmark is. A landmark is a building over 100 years old that has special um, protection where you can't change things in that building without um, an order from the city. And it was like, okay, so now you know what a landmark is. I said, when was a landmark built? over a hundred years ago. Who do you think built it over a hundred years ago? Hmm. Over a hundred years ago, probably a black person. Back then, do you think that black person had an education? Even a high school diploma if they were lucky. You understand? Chances are not, but that building is still standing. And we have many, many landmarks around this city. And we don't worry about the foundation of those buildings. The foundations that we worry about and the buildings that we see for are the ones built by white students with architectural degrees from these white Ivy League schools. Make no mistake about it. The schooling was only introduced to block these black men who were not being given the opportunity to go to school from achieving more so that we could keep them in a space of locking them out because these type of financial institutions required a lot of money, which these black men's families did not have and they did not have themselves. But make no mistake about it, they built that landmark that's still standing strong today. So that speaks to whether or not they can read, whether or not they're talented, whether or not they can follow directions, whether or not they have common sense. You know, it speaks to great abilities. And you went to school, learned it, and your buildings are still dropping. So don't doubt who we are and try to judge us by some of the choices that we make in our community because you don't know what type of trauma that's connected to and where that's birthed from because you've never walked in our shoes. What is your last word? Be kind to yourself and be kind to others.
what has been black people's power has been love. Through it all, we have loved and we need to remember to love ourselves and to love our families and to love others in our community, care for our communities, even though we're not the ones who own our communities. You know, we're renting the space, but we live there. And, you know, for that reason, I mean, I want to live someplace that feels comfortable. When it looks better, it feels better. And so some of the things we can do better on, and we can't blame everything on people outside our community, we have to take some responsibility. And for the changes that we see that we need in our community, be that change, be the leader, lead by example. You don't have to tell other people to pick up the paper and not drop it. When they see you not dropping it and taking it to the garbage, they will follow suit because people are naturally followers. So do the right thing so that people can follow you and make a better community for us. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. If someone wants to get in touch with you. They can get in touch with me through my um, email, advocate and organize at Gmail. Advocate and organize at gmail.com. Yes, or they can look up my website, jmacforfamilies.com. jmacforfamilies.com. Thank you so much, Joy, for taking the time to be with us. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on social media. Thank you for watching. Thanks for allowing me to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much.